I'll get moving pretty close to on time. Probably give another minute or so for trickle ins uh, um, after the actual after turns three. Just turn three thirty. Speaking of which, a um, little bit little time for trickle ins as people tend to like you know get connected. For many people, probably first class of the term, and you know we live in a weird Zoom world where time no longer has meaning. So uh, I'd like to give people a little extra time. And I'll usually be in a little early, you know, three, five, six, seven minutes uh, on both Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, just to sort of uh, answer any questions you have if you have technical stuff going on. Uh, and also if you have technical issues, um, if you can go to labs, because in labs I'll usually try and wrangle those sorts of things. Uh, you could also schedule office hours stuff with me. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Should have gotten a Slack invite I emailed out earlier too. Um, I'll talk about Slack in a little bit. <clears throat> Will you explain a little bit how Slack's um, sign-in process works when you do that? I've been asked to join a couple over the last year and I, I feel stupid, but also a little bit confused by how the sign-in process weird. works. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, don't don't feel stupid about it. Slack is sort of like odd. Once you get used to it, it seems like it's it's like great, but it took me some time to get used to it. Um, I actually typically use um, Slack has a desktop application you can download, and I use the desktop app because I find it a little bit better than like a web interface. Um, and it kind of manages all your different Slack channels for you. Otherwise, Slack is kind of weird in that every single Slack channel you belong to has a different account and password, like they're totally not connected. Um, and then thus for my class, if you'd have to create a new, your own account and everything like that, it's kind of annoying. And the application sort of centralizes all that stuff. You can still have different accounts for different ones, but it, it sort of does like, let me see if I've got the, uh, can I actually bring it up over here. Um, there, I'll use Slack. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, so like on my particular Slack over here, I paired it down. Uh, is that coming in okay for people? Just okay. Um, I've pared it down. This is the Slack desktop web application. And you can usually like, for instance, this is the class uh, C++508 here on here, but you can actually browse between like, this is my sociology department one. I have one for uh, an R package that we were working on ages ago. Um, was that one? Oh, Social 321 for a class I never did get around to teaching. Uh, well, it's good it has a Slack channel. Um, but yeah, uh, you can kind of browse through it. And so what I would do is I, I would recommend the app myself. It's kind of annoying to keep downloading software on your computer, but it works better than the web interface. Um, does that help at all or is that just useless to you? No, that's totally helpful. Um, I, yeah, it's also just nice to hear that I'm not completely crazy. No, 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 not at all. It's one of those things where it's like, um, I think what it is is that so many people live a substantial portion of their lives in Slack or they do not realize that it is kind of a weird, like sometimes technically complicated thing. I'm not one of those people, but a lot of people I know work kind of like more of the software side. I mean, everything is in Slack. Their entire life is running through Slack and they're just like, well, it's the most intuitive thing ever. It's like, I don't know, but it works really well for this class. Um, but it's also not like necessary. You can do everything through the email list if you want. It's just kind of nice for fast questions. Anyway. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, make sure I'm clicking on the right stuff. Lots of people on video. I guess people are starting to settle into the, well, also it's the first day of the term, so never mind. Uh, by the end of it, there will be those two smiling people in video chat and everyone else will be like, you don't want to see how I look. You should not see how I live. Okay. So, anyway. Uh, so, of course, um, if you uh, are here for a class on R, you're in the right place. If you manage to not be in the right place, that's really impressive in our Zoom era, and my hat's off to you. Um, so today is gonna be sort of our, our brief introduction to our studio and R and R Markdown. It's a little bit of a whirlwind today, so I'm just gonna kind of move through it, but still don't hesitate to ask questions. If you don't like chatting um, verbally too, I have the, uh, the um, written chat up and I will read out questions that you ask on here and answer them so that people can also get it on the recording later. So feel free to type them if you don't like uh, talking. Okay, um, so first of all, my goals for this course, just to kind of let you know where I'm at for this, um, the sort of first and foremost goal for this class is to enable you to develop what I call 
intermediate data management and visualization skills in R. Notice I'm not saying like beginner or basic data management skills. I want you to learn the kind of stuff that would be necessary to go straight into working sort of a like an RA job or working your own feces and dissertations and things like that. I'm not going to do just this nuts and bolts stuff where you get to the end of the class, you're like, okay, now I have the tools to go and learn how to do some basic stuff. This class's goal is to get you up to speed with all the things somebody who does applied work, who does like actual quantitative research or, or qualitative research that uses computational elements, all the two, those kinds of tools that people actually use in practice. And to that end, everything in this class is stuff I personally use myself in my work. And I do a lot of quantitative and statistical work and computational work. So these things are like sort of what real people use if, if I pass as a real person. So uh, another thing is I do want you to learn basic programming. So I'm teaching intermediate data management and visualization, but I'm teaching basic programming fundamentals. So this is going to be things like loops and flow control. And it's okay if you don't know what those things mean, because you're here to sort of learn that stuff. But I'm going to teach you sort of fundamentals that apply to every programming language, um, Boolean logic, expressions, and things like that. Um, but I'm going to teach you kind of the basics. You could take that stuff and move to any other programming language, but I'm not going to spend all sorts of time getting into like deep and nuanced things that you could instead learn from a software development class. This class is about getting you up to speed real fast and as intuitively and so as comfortably and painlessly as possible. Next, I'm going to um, be an evangelist and introduce re reproducible research practices in this class and throughout this class um, to the point that every homework you turn in in this class is actually a reproducible research document. So by the end of this class, you're gonna be real comfortable making sort of dynamic reproducible documents because the only thing I'm gonna accept from you, and that's gonna help you in the future because you can do things like do your stats class assignments as reproducible documents and you know take it further. I, I like set up my journal articles as reproducible distributions. And I think that's sort of um, the way good science is going these days. So you kind of get a foundation in that. Next, I am going to prepare you or attempt to prepare you for statistics and CSSS courses. Um, so one of the problems that I sort of uh, felt existed when I first came uh, to UW in the sociology program many moons ago uh, was that you have all these statistics and CSSS courses that teach you advanced stats and they just sort of throw you to the wolves with the programming part of it, which as it turns out ends up being like 75% of the labor in those classes if you don't know what you're doing. So the, this class is supposed to get you up to speed so that you don't have to simultaneously teach yourself data programming at the same time as learning stats and all those other classes, which is deeply, deeply traumatic. And in fact, the way that I know all this R programming as well as I do now is by having, is by forever reliving the trauma of that personal experience. Um, and my goal is so that you don't have to experience that too, that instead you get a nice introduction to this separate isolated in sort of a failure-proof environment, and then you can go take those stats classes and hopefully not be quite as like permanently emotionally damaged. Okay, so who am I? Who is this person who's going to be gibbering at you for the term? Uh, so I'm Chuck. Feel free to call me Chuck. Uh, do not call me Dr. Chuck. Uh, that does sound fun, but um, no, I'm not a doctor. I am just an instructor, not a professor, so it's fun to call me future Professor Chuck or something, but we'll settle for instructor for now. Um, I am, in fact, well, uh, uh, I forgot to change this. I am not a sixth year sociology PhD student. I am a seventh year PhD student. Um, I will be here forever. It is an eternity. Um, but uh, actually, I'm kind of on the job market. But um, anyway, so I've been here a really long time, but I'm just a grad student like you. So don't treat me with any undue respect. Perhaps treat me with less respect than normal. It's perfectly fine. Um, my research areas are generally quantitative sociology, so like broadly I do a lot of uh, statistical modeling, kind of more um, classic and formal modeling type stuff. I do a lot of structural equation modeling, hierarchical models, uh, spatial analysis, things like that, but generally like anything uh, quantitative excites me, though I still do some qualitative work myself. Um, I also am involved in computational social science. I don't have any projects going now, but I do work um, periodically with relatively large data sets in the terabyte range, you know, not truly massive, but I know how to work with big data. Um, and I do some computational work. And I also do field experiments in criminology. I have many, many hundreds of hours in the field doing experiments in crim. Um, so my main area is criminology and I do a lot of like varied stuff. But anyway, you put all these three things together and if you want to translate this into something, 
it's that one, I write code every single day. Everything I do is quantitative or computational or statistical. I'm literally writing some kind of code every day and the only language I work in regularly is R. So I'm living in this myself. I'm not sort of a theoretical person. I'm purely an applied worker in this area. Next, I am a gigantic nerd. I really, really enjoy working in these areas. I love code. I love talking about it. Because I am a giant nerd, you are not bothering me when you bring me problems. If you email me or Slack channel me with something that's broken, you're not, it's not like I'm gonna grow and be like, oh God, what does this person need? I really enjoy like solving these technical problems, especially when they're sticky and weird ones, the error messages don't make any sense, stuff like that. No, 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 these are puzzles. I enjoy them. You're not bothering me. So please, if you get stuck on stuff, if you're stuck on something like for more than five or 10 minutes and not making any progress, put it aside, shoot me an email, do not waste any more of your time. I will be very happy to answer your questions. And lastly, I think programming is incredibly important. This is one of those areas where many of you, um, it used to be everyone in this class was in the social sciences, but nowadays I kind of get people from all over the, uh, the school. Um, but I think programming is incredibly important and it's an undertaught skill in many of these disciplines. It's so vital to all the work that we do to be able to sort of efficiently and reliably process our data and they don't teach us it. Usually they just sort of are like, assume that you're gonna pick this thing up as if it's some intuitive thing that people easily understand. And I believe that that's actually a massive barrier in quantitative work in the social sciences because some people take to this naturally, they have a background in it, they've encouraged their whole lives to work in these things. And then the rest of us are just like, this is terrifying and scary. And if it doesn't click with you, you never learn it. So it's ridiculous. So this class sort of exists because I think it's really important. You should all know this stuff and teaching yourself is like the worst way to learn so much of this stuff. You just need a little bit of walking through it and people to talk with and you'll have a much better experience. Okay, so the logistics of this class, um, well, you're here, so you know where the lecture is. It's Wednesdays, 3.30 to 5.20 in this Zoom channel. You're here, you know where it's at. Um, if you wanna do this asynchronously, you don't have to come to classes. I have no expectations. It's ridiculous if you're a graduate student to like take attendance or something or require cameras to be on anything like that. I record everything and I don't just post it on Zoom. I also post all the recordings on YouTube so you don't even have to like log into Zoom or anything like that. It's all there. Similarly, all the course content for this course is not on Canvas. It is on this publicly accessible website, which is permanently available. All the content is free, it's open source. Use the content for anything you want. If you have people you know who benefit from it, share this stuff with them, including the YouTube videos. It's all open access, do what you want with it. Uh, logistics wise for grading, this class is, I won't say it's impossible to fail. It has happened a few times, but I think every time it's ever happened, that it's been like entirely knowingly and that person's like, okay, yeah, I'm just not gonna get credit on it, but it's okay and they've talked to me. You need 60% of the points in this class to pass and it's either pass or fail. It's pretty hard not to pass, okay. There's homeworks in this class. Most weeks have a homework. They count for 75% of the grade. It's a combination, I say, of reading and programming. It's mostly writing code, following instructions. I recommend some readings. You're not obligated to do them. You're all adults. If you don't have the time, don't do it. Um, homeworks are worth three points. Um, there's a bunch of them. Basically, in this class, if you average slightly under two points per home, actually, slightly over one point per homework, you'll get credit in the class, and you get one point basically for turning it in, you're probably not gonna fail. Um, there is peer grading of homeworks worth one point each week, I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Both these things are handed in via Canvas, and it's the only thing I use Canvas for. Canvas is a really good platform for like grading and handling uh, grades. I don't think it's great for anything else, so I don't use it for anything else. So, it is a very, fine reaction, it's perfectly okay to say, oh God, peer grading. I have actually dropped classes because they involved having to work with other people and I'm that sort of person sometimes. Um, yeah, there's peer grading in this class. So the reason for this, and one of them, is that you will write your reports, your, home, your reports being your homeworks, better knowing that other people will see them. It's a small psychological effect where you feel guilty about the terrible things you commit to uh, um, our studio, and maybe it'll do a little bit better if you share it with other people instead of just with me. You have two eyes judging you. 
Next, um, you will learn, ah, you will earn, you will learn alternate approaches to the same problem. So by seeing other people's homeworks and the things they do, you might learn some other tricks, see how they solve similar things in different ways. And then the nice things about programming or terrible things about programming, depending on how you feel about it, is that there's usually an infinite number of ways to solve a problem. Some of them are more elegant and some of them are faster. It's kind of nice to know multiple ways to solve a problem. Sometimes you'll encounter the same problem, but it'd be better to solve it in a different way later. We're gonna get into that when we talk about things like how to subset data with names and positions. Sometimes you wanna use names, sometimes you wanna use positions, you'll see. Uh, and last, it's kind of a practical necessity. So especially in the era of Zoom, when I'm no longer limited by classroom sizes, I will let everyone into this class who requests to get into it, which means I've had up to 65 people in this class in the past. Right now I've got about 42 to something like that. Um, I don't have a TA and I don't ask for one. Um, so I have to do all this grading stuff myself. And so as a practical necessity, having some pure grading element to it allows me to locate things a little bit faster because people can say things like, this thing didn't knit, it didn't work, you missed this sort of thing, it lets me catch them faster. The other people who are pure grading are not actually assigning you scores or anything, and I often differ in the scores I assign from what the peer graders recommend, but it does let me sort of catch things like that. Um, you'll never get a grade lower than what a peer grader assigns you, and you'll sometimes get one higher, so just to let you know. Uh, the format for peer grading is randomly assigned peers. You turn in homeworks on Tuesday. The peer grading of that one is due basically by the end of the following Tuesday, so we sort of have this staggered thing. You'll get a homework, you'll finish it, and then the next week you'll grade that previous, works, uh, uh, previous week's homework. Uh, there's a grading rubric you can see through the website if you're interested. Um, I say leave some constructive comments, um, more than just saying, good job. Uh, for the first three assignments, I expect you write a few sentences, sort of just comment on what the, per the people did. Um, just be like, oh, you know, you kind of did this, it was interesting, you did this, you could have tried doing this. For assignments four and on, a lot of people are going to be following along with these homeworks in lab, and they're just going to have sort of, they'll look exactly like the one we did in lab. That's fine. If that's the, oh, my hard drive is heating up. Um, anyway, uh, it's fine if it looks like the lab. You can say it looks exactly like the lab. That's perfectly fine, and you can give them their three points. Um, if you want more feedback on any homework assignment you do in this class, shoot me with an e shoot me, don't shoot me with something, shoot an email to me and I will give you all the feedback you could want. Um, perhaps too much, I'm perfectly happy, but I don't do it by default because honestly, most people don't read too much of the comments, so I don't waste too much time. Okay, so materials for this class, like I said, everything is on the course website to a fairly extreme degree. So these slides I'm showing are on the course website and the code that generates these slides is on the website. There's an R script you can follow along in that has all the code found in the slides. There's PDFs of the slides that are automatically generated when I create them. So if you like to take notes on PDFs, those are up there too. There's templates for all the homeworks from homework four and on. The earlier ones are kind of free form. Um, there's also video recordings of the lectures and in our era of Zoom, I'm video recording the labs as well. And there's a lot of useful links to things. There's a lot of crap on there. So if you find something that doesn't work on the website, let me know and I'll fix it. Just Slack me or email me, I'll take care of it. And if you don't know how to find something, Slack me or email me, I'll point out where it is. There's a lot of stuff on there. Okay. So labs. Uh, labs in this class are totally optional. You're not obligated to show up to them, and I record them too, so you also can do them sort of asynchronously. Labs in this class are different from most courses. So in labs one through three, I'm kind of providing general technical support and answering our questions, whether they're for the homework or not. So first lab on Monday, if you've had troubles installing R or something like that, I'm happy to sort of address them in lab. I'll also add, answer how to do any random sort of R things you want. If you have some idea like, well, I really want to do this one thing, but I can't figure out how to do it, we'll work it out together and figure out how to do those things. These ones are kind of open and free form. After that, though, for the latter two thirds of the class, we're just going to walk through the homeworks together. What this is going to do is for people who are interested in doing it, it provides them sort of a guided walkthrough of the more complex stuff. So if you're feeling intimidated by it, you don't feel like you can do this stuff independently, 
that's great. You can come walk through it. We'll work through them together. I'll solicit answers from people. We'll go back and forth, but we'll grind our way through these homeworks together. You'll learn sort of like ideal ways to do the things in it, but it'll still be kind of a collaborative thing. The nice thing about doing this is that, you know, if you're pressed for time, um, I don't know about you, but everything is terrible. And so given these conditions, you know, maybe it's nice to not spend hours and hours working on homework and instead go to the lab, walk through it. S kind of beating your face against it for a while, working on homework, you'll learn a little bit better in my opinion, but not everybody feels like doing that. And honestly, we don't need any more stress in our lives. So feel free to just come to lab and we'll work through it together. Okay, do what works for you. And if none of this works for you, you let me know and we'll figure something out. Okay, so this course has two ways to get help. The first way that I, and sort of the primary way is the mailing list. If you shoot something out to the mailing list, do not act, ask questions that look like this. Uh, oh, so here's a question I saw in chat. Is the lab in person or online? Nothing is in person. The class is entirely online. I haven't seen my office in a month. Um, I have plants in there I should go take care of. Uh, but no, the, the labs are not in person because um, it's in a basement with not great air circulation and I'm sure we would all die. So the mailing list, um, don't ask questions like this. Do not say, I tried LMYX, but it didn't work, what do? Please do not do this. Instead, write questions like a human being um, or adult that look like this. Write out all the code sort of necessary to produce your problem and then post the actual error message you got. If you do something like the top up here, I see this, I'm like, I have no idea what caused this problem other than perhaps some sort of brain damage. But down here, I look at this and I'm like, oh, well, I know exactly what's going on right here. Your Y variable and your X variable are different lengths, so you can't run this model. You have 10 observations of Y and 11 observations of X, and you can't do it. And I can see that instantaneously. It's fine if you can't, you're in an introductory R class. But if you give me enough information here, I can solve your problems rapidly, okay? Um, another thing, this is purely stylistic, it's nice if you use fixed width font for your emails that looks like this, so it's a little easier to like sort of see how things line up. Not obligated, but you know, I'm, a, I'm not a stickler for things. Okay, so the next way to get help is the Slack channel, okay? So this course uses a Slack channel for additional communication. This is basically just a chat system uh, that is typically um, associated with like software developers. It's sort of a task-oriented working uh, um, chat system. You can use it like the mailing list to ask questions, but it's sort of best for asking short questions. If you have a big, long question, you got a lot of code and stuff, or if you have to attach a file, I recommend doing it via email. If you have a quick thing like this thing isn't working, here's the error message, or how do I do something, or what does this function do, shoot into Slack, and that's fine, okay? Um, I also encourage you, if you want, you can use Slack channel during class to ask quick questions. This is something that's often done in workshops. In here, you can also feel free to just use the Zoom chat. The nice thing with Slack chat is it's sort of permanent. If you do something, say something in Slack chat, it's there for the rest of the term. You can go and refer to it, whereas the Zoom chat is sort of isolated. It's still technically safe, but it's a little awkward to get at. If people ask questions on Slack or on the mailing list or in group chat, um, feel free to answer. Don't wait for me to get to them if you want. I like sort of a banter back and forth. I'm pretty high energy person. I tend to get to questions pretty fast, so I might snipe them out from under you, but if you feel like answering them, go right ahead. Okay, and also um, I kind of keep pounding through lectures like this. I will take a break about halfway through, um, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'll just keep churning through otherwise. Okay. So um, a note here on formatting for how to read these slides while you're following along with me. Um, things that I put in bold are usually a vocabulary term. Try to remember these. If you, you see one of those terms, it means it's something that, you know, I kind of would expect you to know or be useful to you to know. Things in italics are sometimes for emphasis, but are just as often used to highlight things you might click with your mouse. For example, seeing file print would mean go to your file menu in the top left of Studio and go down to print. Though if you're printing something out of our Studio, I don't know what you're up to. Um, next, code will look like this. It'll be sort of highlighted in a gray background. It'll be in a fixed width code font. This would represent our code you would actually type into our Studio or your code editor. 
um, or console or keystrokes you might use to perform actions. So for instance, you might see control P and that would open print dialog. I don't know why I was super into printing when I wrote the slide, but control P for print. Code chunks that span the page and look like this are actual R code that are embedded inside these slides that ran when I created the slides. So code that looks like this, basically I wrote something, this is a comment I wrote in here, and then I, all I did is write in the slide seven times 49. When I press the button to generate these slides, it does seven times 49 and spits out output saying 343, because that's seven times 49. So these two little pound signs here, or hashtags for the youth in the room, represent the output of the code here, right? So the code chunk here runs this code, and then the output is after the two pound signs, okay? We're gonna talk about this a lot later. You're going to be making documents using these methods throughout the class, so you're gonna get real comfortable with them over time. Okay, so the plan for lectures in this class, uh, the, the sort of torrent of information we're gonna go through each week. Uh, today is on RStudio and R Markdown. So I'm gonna give sort of an introduction to the RStudio platform and R Markdown for generating sort of reproducible research documents. I'm gonna talk then next week about visualizing data. So like I said in the, about this class, um, this class is not nuts and bolts. This is about like applied work. So I go to the fun stuff immediately and then work backward from that. So we're going to go right into visualizing data with ggplot stuff you could use all the time and probably will if you stick with R. We're going to go to the useful stuff that's fun. We're going to make pretty pictures and show how to modify them. And then we'll get to the traumatic stuff later in the term once you already can't drop it. The next week in three, we're going to work with dplyr to manipulate and summarize data. So these are some of the most common operations you'll perform. Creating variables, selecting variables, reshaping your data in minor ways like summarizing it. Basically the R equivalents of doing things like pivot tables and stuff. We're gonna do that stuff in week three and that's sort of like core fundamental stuff. If you knew really well how to do the stuff in week three and week two, you could probably actually do a lot of common projects that you might do in, in grad school, especially for like master's level projects. Okay, then the next week, uh, we're gonna get into a little bit of nuts and bolts. We're gonna start talking about understanding core R data structures. So this is basically an entire lecture on what are these actual data types we're working with, things like vectors and matrices and data frames and lists how to work with them and sort of what are the implications of their structure. So fundamental stuff, kind of a boring one, um, but it's important for knowing how to interact with these objects. Then we'll jump to importing, exporting, and cleaning data. So this is a lecture that sort of covers two things. It covers like bringing in data from other statistical software packages, because you're probably going to work with people who work in Stata, SAS, Minitab, something like that, uh, also Excel stuff, right? Um, and you also need to be able to export to them. So if you're working in R and your colleagues are working in other software, it can be totally transparent moving between you. Uh, and then we'll also talk about cleaning data, which has um, a few different meanings. Some of that is reshaping data, working with factors and stuff. Uh, then we're going to get into nuts and bolts program. We have an entire lecture on using loops. Loops are a programming method for doing repetitive actions. So doing things repetitively yourself sucks. Computers exist to do repetitive things for us so we don't have to keep doing things over and over again. Loops are about making the computer do these things for us so we don't have to do them. Saves you a huge amount of time. It's kind of the point of having a computer, at least when you get low enough down. Then I'm going to show you how to never use loops again in R because R is something called a vectorized language. Um, and basically show you how it's much faster to not write explicit loops, but work in other ways. So loops are general, is in every programming language that is actually capable of uh, basically performing calculations, basically has some kind of a loop structure in it. Whereas right, the kind of functional structure of R is sort of more unique to R, though it's also similar to Python and, and uh, JavaScript and other languages like that. Talk about that. Uh, then we're going to get into what I call sort of special topics, though some of them are, are um, special but broad and that most people encounter them. The first one is working with text data. This is a class targeted at social scientists and most of you probably work with categorical data of some kind. If you don't learn the specialized skills for working with text, your life will be very difficult working with these things. 
This lecture will teach you how to use regular expressions, which are sort of the uh, logical language of text selection and manipulation. It's one of the most useful skills you could learn in this class if you're ever going to work with categorical text data, especially if you're going to be working with like an actual corpus, like if you work with, uh, say, extracted social media data or the contents of books or speeches or uh, laws or things like that. Uh, then, one of my favorite special topics, we're going to do geographical data. So this is one of those ones you're probably not going to get in other programming classes and, and or statistical classes unless you take spatial stats. Um, it turns out R is a really good um, geographical information systems platform. So I'll teach a lecture on how to use R as a GIS platform to do mapping and sort of the build up to geostatistics. It turns out it's really, really easy to do in R. So I might as well teach it. It's pretty fast. And then I'll finish up with um, an extended rant about reproducibility that you'll be mostly captive for and uh, how to extract model results from the statistical models you run in every CSS or stats class and produce nice tables and plots of those results, including things like counterfactual plots and stuff um, in like really easy syntax. Okay, so much easier than you would learn those methods in any other CSS class. And I know because I've taken basically all of them. Uh, and these methods are substantially easier. Okay, so that is basically the plan for the term. Um, does anybody actually remember, and I forgot this, is there an 11th lecture this, this fall? Anybody know? Okay, if there's not, then that's fine. If there is, I'll tack on another lecture about some other special topic. Um, we'll see. I don't think there is, but there might be. Okay, so now onward. Let me evangelize R in our studio. You're already in this class, so you probably know, but you're stuck listening to me, so I'll rant a little bit. Okay, so um, why learn R, right? So um, a lot of you probably know why you'd like to learn R, but I'm gonna give you some reasons, um, and also reasons you could go share with other people. Maybe you wanna convince them too, so you have friends living this trauma together. So R is a programming language built for statistical computing. If you already know something like Stata or SAS or Minitab, why would you want to use R, right? Well, the big one, R is free. You don't need a terminal server. You don't need to pay for a license. You can put it locally on your computer. That is a big advantage. I have access to like tremendous computational power on campus through like the SIM cluster and stuff, but I hate using all of it because it's not on my computer and it's a little bit awkward and I'm that kind of a person. I like having my software on my computer and local, not in the cloud, I don't wanna have an internet connection or something like that to access it. It's free, right? R also has a really large community. R's community is massive. And in terms of actually doing uh, like statistical stuff with R, its community is larger than any other programming languages community for working in stats. So if you're doing quantitative data analysis, this is the place to be. Big communities are nice because if you run into problems, you can go and ask for help. And when you ask for help, something you will find is R has one of the friendliest online communities out there. R people tend to be really nice, especially the people you find on Twitter and things like that. They're great folks. And it's also a much more inclusive community than most other programming languages. You look at organizations like R Ladies that are sort of put workshops together that are women oriented programming workshops. There's also like R working groups throughout like the developing world. It's fantastic, right? Yeah, somebody says it's your most wholesome fandom on the internet. The R community is really nice and they don't tolerate people being like mean um, and being uh, exclusive, okay? It's a great community. It's one of the things I like most about R. Next, R can handle basically any data format. I used to have this pledge in my class until uh, I guess fall last year that if you could find me an unencrypted data format, I can't open an R, I would like buy you a beer. Somebody who works at a library in Canada brought me an archival format that I couldn't find a way to open an R. I eventually figured out a way to pop it open because it turned out to be a really weird database slice uh, <laughs> file, but basically I couldn't find it, so I owe some guy in Canada a beer. But it took years for that to happen. If you've got data from basically any source, R can handle it, it can digest it. R users also abhor closed, uh, like closed source platforms. So a good example, let's see somebody mentioning, Izzy mentioned Stata in here. Stata people are mean, because it's mostly economists. Um, but uh, so somebody, um, 
basically Stata changed data formats between Stata 12 and 13 so that um, Stata 12 could not open Stata 13 data, fi uh, data files. Before the Stata 13 disks arrived at my previous university, an R package came out to read Stata 13 files. And they ordered, they like pre-ordered Stata 13. Our users abhor closed formats and will do everything to crack them open because it's sort of an entertaining thing. You can always open it in R. Okay. Next, big one. R makes replication easy and non-replicable science is bad science. So do not be a bad scientist. Learn replicable methods. R is like on the forefront of reproducible research and replication. Uh, another one, R is a language. R is a full-fledged programming language. So unlike sort of the language in say SAS or the, the language most of us encounter in Stata, the underlying Stata language is actually basically a full-fledged programming language. R can do anything. If a computer can do it, you can make R do that thing. So I've seen people do, and I have done a little bit myself, audio and video editing. I've made like um, animated GIF memes in R before, because it's a good way to do repetitive actions, like making things spin around. It can do basically anything. You can go and scrape web addresses, automate things. You can make Twitter bots, you name it. It can be done anything you want to do, you can do it in R. So it can be kind of a one-stop shop. It's not always the best way to do it, but if you learn R well enough, one way or another, you can kludge together a solution to any problem. And lastly, if you want to move to another language for something else, R is actually a good stepping stone to other languages, like, for instance, Python. So if you're going to go work in the industry, Python is a little bit more common in the industry, say, in business, because it's a little bit more data science-y. It's easy to move from R to Python. It's actually easier to move from R to Python than Python to R in general, just due to, due to sort of the uh, Pythonic way of writing things. R is a good language to step to other things. R is a little older language with some odd syntax, which will prepare you for things like JavaScript. Um, it's a good language to jump to other stuff. So most of the things you learn in R, they're not wasted. Even if R does die, which isn't likely to happen anytime soon, you know, if something like Julia becomes ascendant, you can take almost all the skills you learn in R and apply them over there, which is not true if you work in SPSS or Stata. Those things do not generalize nicely to other programming languages. Okay. So, uh, R Studio is not R. This is a separate piece of software, and if you've installed it, you know this sort of already. R Studio is just a front end, or what is called an integrated development environment, or IDE, for R. R Studio is a piece of software designed to make your life easier while working with R, and it's the main way that I recommend interacting with R, unless you have a lot of past programming experience. If you're one of those people who has Emacs on your computer, you already know what you're doing. You do you. So R Studio can do a lot of things. It can organize your code, your output, and your plots. And so I'll show the interface and walk you through it. There's all sorts of tabs that sort of have everything you need. It can auto-complete code and highlight syntax. Auto-completion of code is really nice. If you have long names for functions or objects that you're using, it's nice to not have to fully retype them each time. You can partially type them and hit tab. It will finish writing it for you. Saves you a little bit of time. It'll also color code your syntax to kind of let you know what stuff is where so you can like quickly scroll through and find things. Next, it can help you view data and objects. If you want to pop open and see what your data frame looks like, there's a viewer. If you want to see what's inside, like some model results, there's a little thing you can click about it and it will show you what's inside of it. Just kind of lets you access all the things that are loaded. Next, it enables the easy integration of R code into documents like these slides. So you can simultaneously draft a document and embed your R code in it. You can take this to extremes, like for instance, writing your entire dissertation as a, a collection of where essentially R scripts with uh, text woven into them. A lot of people I know actually do this. Um, R Studio sort of facilitates doing this in a nice way. So. The thing I was talking about, this mixing of text and code together, in R is called R Markdown. There's also an older way to do it with LaTeX called sleeve documents, but I'll tell you why you should not learn LaTeX except for narrow things in a little bit. Um, but R Markdown is nice. R Markdown is a really powerful advantage of R that currently even, even Python sort of implementation of something equivalent, which are um, Jupyter notebooks and things are lagging a little bit behind in general, um, but they're pretty close. Stata has an implementation of this that is essentially the cave person version of R Markdown. 
one day they'll catch up. Okay, so our markdown files allow you to document your analyses by combining text and code and output into a single document. When you run the document, it runs the code, takes the output from that, which includes plots and everything, puts them in the document so you have everything together in one document, right? This means you'll never again, if you use this, have to copy and paste something from your stats program and put it in a Word document. You've probably all done that in your stats sequence class or something. You could never do it again. This is really nice, right? You're not sitting there copying things over, copying things over. God forbid you change one thing in your models and you have to change the entire document, copying, pasting stuff over. No, you change that one thing and rerun the document and everything just updates, right? Okay. These are also really easy to understand for your collaborators because the written content and the code are next to each other so you can explain what you're doing, show the code and the results and explain those and keep using them. If you follow it like sort of a journal, a notebook, kind of like a lab notebook in like a physical science classes or something like that, you can follow the entire procedure and see everything happening and run it piece by piece to see how it works. This is a really good way to document things and I kind of like to do like, to some degree journal articles this way, though I tend to run them in the background and stuff, but some we'll talk about later. Okay, another thing is that you can show as little or as much code as you want. You can actually have tons of code embedded in these documents, but the end user who looks at them can't see any of it. You could actually make it so it dynamically generates an entire document and they never see a single piece of code. They don't know what's behind the hood, right? This is nice for doing things like creating documents that update all the time and generate memos. People don't want to see the code. They want to see the results, but you can embed all that code inside of it, just rerun it, and boom, it spits out a memo that updates all the text, all the plots, all the tables. This is great, right? If you want them to see the code, you can turn that on too. Another thing is that our markdown documents can produce many different types of documents. You're not stuck just producing like a Word document or something. PDF documents, you can produce beautiful looking PDF documents. The way our markdown does it is it actually converts it more or less into LaTeX in the background. It generates beautiful documents that look like those produced by LaTeX, except without all of the enduring trauma associated with writing something in LaTeX. It also nicely produces HTML web pages and reports. These slides, for example, are actually um, just an HTML web page. You could pop them open and look at the source. It's just a, a web page that you can flick through an HTML5 one, gussied up a little bit. Um, you can produce this. I like to share and use HTML documents because everybody has a browser on their computer or phone, so you can open them and share things, right? Everything except final like journal articles and things, I tend to give to people as an HTML document. You can also produce Word and PowerPoint documents. And there's some packages out there that uh, some folks I know have created that allow you to also digest Word and PowerPoint documents into our Markdown documents to work with them and sort of work back and forth between Word docs and uh, our Markdown, right? A lot of flexibility there. You can also generate, like I keep saying, presentations like these slides. Basically every presentation I do, whether or not it has any code embedded in it, is probably done up as a set of R slides. Uh, largely due to path dependency, I am lazy and I don't want to make new slides. Okay. Also, our markdown, you can, if you want, embed LaTeX and HTML into these documents to like display math or do more formatting control. Okay. So if you need a little bit more precision in how things look, you can add these more complicated things, but you're not obligated to do so. Okay. So it's nice, there's a lot of flexibility, but you don't have to use it. And most people don't do too much of that. Okay, so we're gonna get back to this R Markdown stuff in a little bit, but first I wanna sort of talk about R Studio and R. Okay, so let's get started here, right? So if you pop open R Studio, if you're following along, I mean, if you want to just sort of stare at the video and do your own thing, perhaps you're knitting an Afghan or something, you do you. But if you wanna follow along, pop open our studio and what we're going to do is we're going to go up and open a new script file and I'm going to show you the interface. So I've got uh, somewhere around here I got our studio up. Okay I've got our studio up and basically what I'm saying for you it's probably going to look when you first open it something like this. If you've updated it recently it should be 4.0.2. Uh, here let me increase this. Um, I have a very high resolution monitor so uh, let's see let's go to uh, appearance it be a, yeah, zoom, let's boost that. Ah, there we go. Now it's huge to me, but legible to you. Okay, 
So if you go up to this top left little green plus up here in the document thing, you'll see you can generate a lot of different types of documents. We're going to go through and just generate a new R script file. So I'm going to click R script. You're going to get a blank sheet of limitless potential where you can write whatever you want. Okay. This window that pops up when you do that, this is the what I call the editor window. The editor window is where you're going to type most of the code you work with in our studio. Right? Anytime you want to run any kind of function, you want to perform any kind of analysis, this stuff is going to be written up here in the editor window. If you've worked with Stata, this is kind of like the do file editor. Okay? But you want to do most of your stuff up here. Down here is the console. The console is where you might type like commands you want to run once, but you never want to run again. So this is sort of the same thing as the console in Stata, right? Generally, you will write most things in the editor and only sort of certain functions and rare things written in the console directly, one-time operations. One thing that you'll do here is like installing new software packages in R. You'll do that down here, but most other things are going to happen up here in the editor window. The other panes on here include the environment pane up here, so this tab environment, which I just clicked and now dominates the area. Okay environment up here, this will show the things you currently have loaded in R. This is a freshly opened R here, so nothing is being shown here. But if I load a data set, like say I say data MT cars, it's going to show that now there's some MT cars data frame listed up here. It's going to say something weird about promises. I'll talk about that later. Um, but basically, it shows the things that you load up here. Okay. There's also some other things which most people don't use too often. There's a history panel that shows the commands you've run recently. These are a bunch of commands I ran for another project. Connections, Git, an interface for Git. There's a tutorial pane up here for running tutorials. Bunch of stuff. Most people just use the environment pane. Down right is sort of a multi-function area. So here there's a file manager so you can browse around and see all the files on your computer. Right here, this is sort of the directory associated with this particular class. So if you downloaded my class from the internet, you'd see the same file structure, except not the homework keys and stuff. Um, all that stuff is here. There's also a pane here for showing plots. If I generate a plot, plots will show down here. And there's also information on what packages I have installed and loaded. There's tutorials for getting help on things. And there's a viewer that will show things like uh, um, output from certain table packages and things. We'll see these things continuously throughout the next week, so don't worry about like memorizing that stuff. That's just sort of the stuff you see. Here's a question in chat that I just saw. Charles, do you have to have both Xcorts and Xcode to use R and R Markdown on Mac? No, you don't actually have to use them, but if you don't have Xcorts installed, um, R will have trouble opening windows. Um, like R Studio will have problems opening up plot windows. Xcorts is used for generating um, windows that you can kind of move around. Xcode is mostly used for installing packages that need compilation. So you don't necessarily need it, but I do recommend you do both, um, just so you can both pop open windows and uh, install packages. But they're not strictly necessary. If you have some sort of limitation that prevents you from installing one or either of them, you ought to be fine. Okay. So that's sort of the layout of Studio. If you like to move it around because you're used to something like Stata, you do you. Move it around. Okay. Somebody have a question or is that just audio? Okay. So editing and running code. So, uh, oh, here's a question. What's the difference between our GUI 32 and our GUI 64? Uh, well, they're both things you probably don't want to run. So the R GUI is sort of a way to pop up a terminal window. If you open R GUI in either case, it's going to uh, basically just pop open a window that does the same as the console down here. But what the difference between them is, is R GUI 32 is the 32-bit version of R, and R GUI 64 is the 64-bit version of R. If your computer was manufactured in the last decade, it's probably capable of 64-bit R. 32-bit R will limit you to four gigabytes of RAM. Okay. Sort of backwards compatibility. Either way, you probably won't use either of those, but instead just open our studio. Unless you're like using Emacs and things to talk to. Okay. Uh, so editing and running code. There are several ways to run code in our studio. 
The first is you can highlight lines up in that editor window and either click run at the top or hit control enter on Windows or command enter on a Mac and it will run everything you currently have highlighted. Another thing you can do is you can put your caret on the line you want to run. You're like, the caret? If you haven't done any programming before, the caret is not a vegetable. The caret is this little blinking cursor that shows you where you're highlighting the text. The thing that I'm moving around right now is a cursor, mouse cursor. That blinky thing is a caret. Programmers are particular about this sort of thing. You can call them both a cursor if you want. But if you put your caret on a line and hit control enter or command enter, your caret will run that line of code and then move to the next line. If you want to run a whole bunch of lines of code one after another, you can basically just hold down control or command and keep rapidly hitting enter and it will run line after line after line after line of code. Okay. You can also type individual lines into that R console at the bottom of our studio and press enter. But most of the time, any code you want to run, you probably want to run it again or you're kind of going to iteratively work on it. So you should write it in the editor instead. Okay. In our Markdown documents, which you're going to be familiarizing yourself uh, with throughout this term, you can click within a code chunk, and you'll learn what that means in lab especially, and click the green arrow to run the chunk. The button beside that will run all prior chunks. I'll really quickly show you an R Markdown document. So this is an R script file. R script files you just write code in. R Markdown documents, like for instance today's slides, this is actually the file for today's slides, the stuff I'm lecturing off right now. This is what it looks like. It's an R Markdown document. It has code embedded in the slides. If I scroll down to a section that has some code, doo -doo 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 -doo. how about the next slides I'm about to get to? Um, I could just put my cursor in here and press this green button. It would run the code. I could hit Control Enter. It will run the code and it will just kind of produce the results right inside my document. I'm not gonna dwell on this because we're gonna spend all our time in lab in our markdown documents and you're gonna write all your homeworks in these, okay? So you can basically run them in chunks, many different ways to run code. You do whatever is comfortable. So regardless of how you ran this, um, the console or the R Markdown document is going to show the lines of code you ran, followed by any output that those code lines produce. Okay. So, if you type some code that is in some way incomplete in R, like for instance, I have this equation here that I'm writing. I'm saying open parenthesis 11 minus 2, but I forget to close the parenthesis. If I run this line, R is not going to do anything. Instead, it's going to go to the next line and leave a little plus sign here. This plus sign is R's way of saying you didn't finish writing your code, or at least I'm pretty sure you didn't. You could finish writing the command by like doing a close parenthesis, or if you don't know why it's giving you that, you can hit escape a couple times and it will sort of stop running that command. Okay, so if you have something like this where it hangs with a plus and you don't know why, just escape out of it and look up and see if you forgot to put a parenthesis or something somewhere. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, if you've got your R Studio open right now, so you've got your R Studio open in the console, type along with me: one two three plus four five six plus seven eight nine, and press enter. I can do that here. I can say in my console. One, two, three, plus four, five, six, plus seven, eight, nine. If you hit enter, we are going to again get 1,368. R is a statistical software package, and we would hope it is capable of doing basic math. It does indeed work as a calculator, okay? So you do that, you should get something like this. So you run that, you get the right number. There might be something seriously wrong with your computer if you do not get that number. Perhaps see if it is currently on fire. Okay. So in this particular output you see right here next to the pound signs, there is a little one in brackets. This indicates the numeric index of the first element of that line. That is a bunch of jargon and gibberish, which basically just says that whatever thing is immediately next to that number, that is the, the uh, essentially the number of objects in whatever object you're displaying. That is the first one. So an example of this would be I could 
come here and say, let's get a sequence of numbers from one to a thousand. In the output here, you'll see all these brackets over here. This is saying basically that, oh, whatever number is directly to the left of this is the 622nd element of this uh, um, basically vector of numbers I generated. It just happens to be the number 622 because I created a sequence of numbers from one to a thousand, but I could do something instead like, uh, you know, it's five to a thousand. So the 530th number in the series is the number 534. This just tells you how to find a number. If you looked at these and all these numbers looked fine, but one of them looked messed up, you could say maybe this one here looks messed up. You'd say, oh, well, that's number 530. 531, 532, 533, 534, 535, and you can go and find it in your data and fix it. Okay, if that doesn't make any sense. It's okay. We'll see a bunch of this later as we keep going. Okay. And so, as, as you may notice, there's a relentless pace in this class, especially in the first week or two, mainly due to time. Treat my class like a fire hose. Do not attempt to open your mouth directly in front of the fire hose and ingest all knowledge from the class. Take sips here and there with the knowledge that you can come back to the videos and the slides to pick things back up. If you try and get every single th thing on the first time through, you will drown. Okay, so the idea is that I give you lots and lots of help and access to me for troubleshooting, but at the same time, you run through a lot of information to try and get everything somehow done in a one credit class in one term. Okay, so with that said, um, in your blank R document that you've created, that is your editor little script file, try typing this line, SQRT parentheses 400, and then either click run or hit control enter on that line and see what you get. Okay. You ought to see something that looks like this. Should run something like SQRT 400 and it should spit in your console an output of 20. So what does SQRT do? Sorry, square root. Yeah, it's a square root, right? 20 times 20 is 400, okay? SQRT, it's at least an intuitively named function. So this thing, SQRT, is a function in R. So functions are the ways you perform just about every operation in R. In fact, basically anything that does anything in R is a function. Well, actually, literally anything that does anything in R is a function. If you did not know what that did, so if you wrote, if you had it, saw somebody's SQRT 400, and you're like, what is SQRT? R has built-in help files, okay? Oh, so here's a question in chat. Um, somebody, and if you ask me a private message, I will read it out loud anyway. So no reason to do private messages. We're all friends here. So somebody asks, why doesn't mine have the two pound signs? It just looks like that. In the console here, if I do SQRT, mine will look just like yours. In the R markdown documents, the pound signs are there to show you its output. So to make it clear, it's just sort of a, a way to um, differentiate. Okay. So R has built-in help files. If you want to know what square root does, you can type in the console question mark SQRT, and it's going to bring up a help file, and I'll show you. I picked square root because square root has a uninformative weird help file. So if you type question mark SQRT, it does not bring up a help file for square root it brings up a help, fi help file for math fun. Well, all math is fun, so that's not specific. This is a base set of miscellaneous mathematical functions. So this help file is for not just square root, but also for ABS, which is the absolute value. Our help files look like this. They have a description of the function that you just got help on, usually the name of the function at the top, and then they'll have a section called usage. The usage will be something like SQRT X. And you're like, well, what does that mean? What it means is this function square root takes inputs that are listed in the arguments section. So X, whatever we give to SQRT, the input can be any numeric or complex vector or array. This is a lot of lingo to say square root can take a square root of any number. 
Okay. So that's what it means. And then there's all sorts of details that um, might break your brain, depending on how, how much you want to get into this, how much you read. But basically, the more time you spend in R, the more useful these help files become. Things like the details down here will give you all sorts of extra information. R help files on core functions built into R are often borderline useless because they are written for statistical programmers. The help files for many of the functions I teach in this class that are in the tidyverse stuff are really informative and useful. My recommendation though is if you get help on a help file, you look at it and this thing down here in the panel looks like gibberish, go Google your answers. Google is your friend and a big thing in this class I'm gonna talk about is learning proper language to enable you to go search for solutions rather than use the help files because they're not always useful, okay? But know they exist and you can often get useful stuff. Okay, um, one nice thing though in help files, they all contain examples. So if you scroll all the way down to the help file, you'll see examples and this will show you a reproducible example that you can run this exact code and it will produce some results. So you can kind of see how it works and modify it and play with it if you need to use it. This is really useful for really complex stuff like statistical routines, probably less useful for something like a square root. So help files are kind of handy. It's good to know about them, but the earlier you are in your R career, the less useful they are. Somebody like me, the help files are tremendously useful, but it took a while, a year or two for them to be super useful to me. Hopefully it'll be a little faster for you. Okay. So functions take inputs. Square root here, right? Take some numeric input we put in there. So, um, oh, I don't have any more on that. We're gonna see a lot of functions. Basically, most functions in R will be some set of letters like this and some parentheses afterwards. The arguments or the inputs to the function go inside the parentheses. We're gonna see a million examples and spend the entire class using functions. I'm not gonna dwell on it anymore. Okay, so in R, everything in R is an object. Data is an object. The functions you run are an object. Somebody asks here, what is a vector? A vector is a type of object. It is a one-dimensional object that stores a single type of data. I'm gonna show you how to make vectors in a minute, so you've anticipated one of my uh, next slides. Objects include literally everything you encounter in R. Every function, every statistical model, every piece of data, plots even, are all objects. So if you're going to use R, you need to know how to use and create objects. <clears throat> so you create an object in R using the assignment operator. Bold means it's important. The assignment operator is the less than sign followed by the minus sign. It is a little arrow pointing to the left. Okay, so let's say what I want to do is I want to create a new object. I'm going to call my new object new.object. What I want new.object to contain is the number 144. So I say number 144 is assigned to new.object. So you can imagine this is like a little arrow that says this thing on the right side goes inside this thing on the left side. That's all it is, taking the thing on the right and putting it in the thing on the left. <clears throat> In other programming languages, equal sign is used for assignment, but in R, you normally want to use the assignment operator. Equals also works, but in rare edge cases, it will break in terrible ways. So it's highly recommended to use this operator. So this thing I keep calling an operator, the assignment operator, assignment operators are also a function, kind of like square root but they look like symbols instead of having parentheses. The way operators work is they are a function where the arguments tend to sit on either side of the symbol, but they're still a function, right? So the thing is, is you're like, ah, oh, that seems kind of confusing that you have some function here, but its arguments go outside of it. If you think about it, this is actually super intuitive because you have since kindergarten been using operators in your life. We do math with operators. When you say take x plus y, plus is an operator that does addition. It's a function that takes the thing on the left side and adds it to the thing on the right side and produces the result. 
Operators in R are just like the plus sign, the minus sign, the division sign, all of those, right? It just does something to the things on both sides of it and spits out a result. R does allow you to do some weird stuff though. If you would instead like to write like addition using parentheses, you can write it like this. Put some back ticks around the plus sign and then call the arguments in parentheses and it will work. There's very rare situations where you might want to do it. And I'd almost advise that you just put that out of mind to avoid confusion. But I put it there because some programmer inevitably asks me a question about it. And I'm like, well, fine. Okay. Operators write are a common way to interact with our data and perform operations. They're a function, but they just kind of are transparent, right? It's like doing math. Okay. So if you want to display an object in R, anything you've created in R, you just type its name and do control enter or type it in the console and hit enter. So earlier I created an object called new.object. If you remember, I assigned the number 144 to it, right? If I say new.object and hit enter, I get the number 144 out, okay? So we basically just assigned something to new.object. So object names in R have relatively few restrictions. You can basically name something anything you want. They can contain underscores and periods. Your only real restrictions are they can't begin with numbers, and I don't think they can begin with underscores. Um, other than that, you're pretty free. I say try to be consistent in naming objects and do not use really short object names. Do not name your data data. Do not name all the variables in a data set var1, var2, var3. Those are not informative. Your names can be arbitrarily long. Good names will save confusion later. It's not always easy to determine what a good name is, but when in doubt, err for something that uh, is readable. Okay, and RStudio has built in auto completion. This is what typing looks like apparently. Um, RStudio has built in auto completion, so you can type like the first three, four, five letters of something, and then it will try and finish it for you. So, for example, if I sit down here and I start to type something like, for instance, the MT cars data, I might say MT, hit tab, and it will bring up a little menu and show different things that I could type that begin with those letters. If you got really long names for objects, you don't have to type them. Start to type them, hit tab, look through the menu for it. Later on in class, I'll show you uh, in week eight how this becomes really powerful for uh, calling functions and packages. Because some packages, all the functions begin with the same two letters. Okay. So, using an object. Okay, in R, the name of an object, like new.object, represents all the information stored in that object, which means you can treat an object's name as if it was the value stored inside, because it is the value stored inside. This means I could say something like this. I could say, take new.object and add 10 to it. Well, new.object is 144. If I add 10 to it, it's 154, which means new.object really is the number 144. I could add it to itself and I'll get 288, I can take the square root of new.object and I'll get 12 because I picked a perfect square so that I would get an integer result, okay? So you can treat things assigned to a name like that as if they are whatever you assign to them because they are. That thing, that object is the number 144, okay? Questions about anything so far? I know it's a torrent of information. Any niggling things yet? Okay, no, okay. We'll take a break here in a minute. I normally just burn through the entire lecture in my class, but I'll take a fiver here in, in a bit, uh, just because Zoom is exhausting to people. Okay, so the question that was anticipated earlier is, what is a vector? Well, a vector is a series of elements, such as numbers, okay? So you can create vectors, and you can store them as an object in the same way we assigned new dot object earlier. The thing is, is if you want to create a vector, which is just a series of things like numbers, you need to use a function. This function is C. C stands for combine, or in the fancy words of programmers, concatenate. It's actually technically not a concatenate function, but it looks like the ones in other languages. It works like this. If what I want to do is I want to create a new dot object and assign to that a vector of numbers. I'm going to assign to it the numbers four, 
9, 16, 25, and 36. I assign them to new.object. I then call it, and it spits out 4, 9, 16, 25, and 36. These are five different numbers. This is a vector. It's a vector in the same way that like vectors in uh, linear algebra are a vector, or matrices are sort of a selection of vectors that are, have multiple dimensions, right? Um, it's a vector, okay? It's multiple numbers. In R, most things we work with are gonna be a series of numbers like this. They are vectors. They're one of the most common data types in R. Okay? It's just a series of elements, usually numbers, but they could also be text. Okay. So you'll notice here that I named this object the same name as an object that already existed. I named it new.object, right? Well, it just overwrote it. In R, R is a destructive language. If you name something the same name as something that already exists, it will overwrite it. The thing is, R will even do this for functions. If I assigned 4, 9, 16, 25, and 36 to the letter C, it would overwrite the function that allows me to make vectors, causing things to break rapidly. Okay? This is another reason to use good names. Don't use names of functions like data and stuff like that. It's going to overwrite them. It's not permanent. It doesn't like break your R or something, but as long as you're in this particular session of R, it will be overwritten. Okay. You can provide vectors like this as an argument for many different functions in R because R is a vectorized language. So for instance, I can get the square root of every element of new.object by just running square root on it. If I run square root on this object, it gives me the square root of all of these things independently, right? I picked perfect squares, so 4, 9, 16, 25, 36 becomes 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. This is a powerful thing in R. Many other languages are vectorized like this, but it just sort of can handle an arbitrarily large number of numbers and just does it, okay? Um, so somebody asked me the question here, how to understand the prefix pound pound one here? Basically, the pound pound is just saying the stuff to the right of it is the type of output you would see in your like R console. So this is just a convention for my slides to show you output. The one over here says the first element to the right of this bracket is the first element of this object. There's only one line of output, so it's not the most informative. But if this continued on to a next line, the next number might be like 27 to indicate the first element over here is the 27th element of it. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Wow, we're going a little slow. I'm probably not going to take that break, actually. Sorry. Okay. More complex objects. So the same principles that I just showed you for creating vectors can be used to create more complex objects in R. Things like matrices, arrays, lists, and data frames. Data frames are things that look like a matrix, but they can hold multiple data types at once. Most stuff we're going to work with in R is going to be stored as what we call a data frame, which is basically like a spreadsheet. So basically, this whole course is going to focus on manipulating and visualizing data frames instead of these other data types. Okay, we'll get into them in a little bit. But first, I want to revisit our markdown. So uh, normally, I'd have a break here, but somehow it's already 445. So what happens when I ramble too much? I shouldn't be given a camera. Okay, so. Uh, R Markdown documents. Let's next try creating an R Markdown file in your R Studio. So if you go up to File, New File, and R Markdown, make sure it selects HTML output and click OK, and then save it somewhere. So I'm going to show you. If you go up here, go to File, New File, R Markdown. It's going to pop up a little thing where if you want, you can give it a title, you can give it an author. Keep it set to HTML. You could also do a PDF or a Word document if you're set up for it. Click OK. And it's going to give you a not blank document. The way our markdown documents give you as a default is they'll give you some example sort of uh, um, uh, text in here in code to kind of show you how they work. So what I want you to do is basically go ahead and click this knit button. If you click the knit button, it's going to bring up a, uh, a window like this to save it somewhere. I'm just going to go ahead and save it in sort of a random place called example document. Once you save it, it's going to knit this document. 
What knitting does in R Markdown is it takes this syntax you would write in the R Markdown document, it runs all of the R code found in these chunks. So these right here are chunks of code. It will run any R code in those chunks, and then it will produce a document that knits together the written text like this. See where it says hashtag, hashtag R Markdown? That makes big text. Then the rest here, this is an R Markdown document. It just writes it as text. But then when you get down to the chunks, like summary of cars, it shows you the code summary of cars and then generates the output from running that function in the document. It also includes plot output. Here I've just done a plot of these pressure data that are built into R. It generates a nice plot of it, okay? This is the power of an R Markdown document. It allows you to write R code inside these chunks and knit together the text and the code into output documents. You could imagine this could be your homework in one of your statistics classes, right? Except in the R chunks, you write the code that runs the things, and then under them, you write the explanations of the results all in one document. You don't have to go and copy paste between Word and stuff. It's super easy to do because you can see how simple the syntax over here is. And you can sort of just modify these things and see what happens, okay? We're gonna play around with this a lot in lab and uh, you'll get lots of examples. Ah, here's a great question. To knit your slides, do we just copy paste the R&D text into the editor? No, if you want to knit my slides and they look like this, you're going to have to jump through some interesting hoops. My slides are written using a package called Sharingan in R, which is made for slide generation. You would actually need to have that package installed to knit my slides. And they also call on some external resources like cascading style sheets. Um, if you want to knit my slides, you'd need to install Sharingan using install packages, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And you'd need to ideally just download the entire class as a zip file, which you can do from the course webpage and open it up there because it's actually calling on things in other directories in there. I wouldn't directly knit my slides most of the time. There's a lot of stuff going on in them. <clears throat> you can steal code from inside them, but knitting them is a little bit complicated. For me, I can just knit them. If I press the button on my slides, it's gonna run a whole bunch of stuff. And here's today's lecture slides, right? So yeah, for me, it knits them like this, but it requires some special stuff installed. Okay. Okay, so moving on, um, that's how you knit things. Okay, uh, you could also open up that file like in your browser. There are HTML documents by default, so you can open them in Chrome, Safari, Mozilla, Netscape Navigator, whatever you do. Okay, okay. So at the top of that RMD file is something called a YAML header. So if I show you right here, this thing up on the top of this big junk document or the small one up here is referred to as a YAML, Y-A-M-L header. This is just some, something to know language-wise. If something is broken up in there, you're gonna have to Google YAML header. YAML stands for YAML ain't markup language because nerds like recursive acronyms. This is a little block up here that tells the document how to knit into things like a PDF or an HTML document, how to put like your author name up there in bold up at the top of the document. You normally don't modify it manually too much, and if you do, it might be a little finicky. Okay, it looks something like this. If you had title, untitled, author, me, date, and an output HTML document, when you knit this document, it's gonna produce an HTML document it's gonna have the title untitled at the top, a smaller subtitle of my name, and a sort of a subtitle of the date. These things just sort of specify what that all looks like. <clears throat> okay, if you want to mess with global formatting, and what I mean by global formatting is if you wanna make the entire document look differently, you can theme it. You can modify themes by doing things like taking this output line and changing it to be like output, space, space, the number of spaces is actually important here, unlike everywhere else in R, HTML document, and then give it a theme, and it will look different. I wouldn't mess with it right now, but you might experiment with it during your first homework, maybe try and give a wacky theme to your homework. There's a bunch of them built in, and there's sort of information on this if you click the link here or look at the links on the course website. Okay. R Markdown has a lot of fun syntax for making things look nice. Um, 
if you want, for instance, uh, so the left side is basically what it would look like in your document if you knit it. The right is what you would write in the R Markdown document. If you put two asterisks around some text in your document, it makes it bold. If you put a single pair of asterisks around your item, it makes it italic. If you put a pound sign in front of it, it makes a really big header. The more pound signs you put in front of it, the smaller the headers get. If you want to do block quotes, you just put a little greater than sign here, and it makes a block quote. So you can do some minor formatting for nice whole works and memos and stuff. You can also do things like lists. Ordered lists that number themselves can be done by putting, for instance, I could just put the number 1111 over and over again, and it will automatically renumber them to be the correct number. You don't even have to manually number them correctly. If you want, you could do one, two, three, and four. If you indent them, it will do sublists within it. If you do a single asterisk and then text afterwards, it does bullet points. A single plus sign will do sublists like this or an open bullet point. You can add URLs like links in your document by taking some text and putting square brackets around it and then a URL in parentheses. And you can insert pictures by doing an exclamation point, square brackets, and this can be any text you want. It's the alternate text for the image. And then a URL that goes to the image or a file location on your computer. And it will stick that image into the document. Okay, Basically, just like a syntax for creating web pages, it just works. You can also do things like jazz it up with some math. If you know a little bit of LaTeX for making equations, you can stick math syntax up in here. So for instance, I could write something like y equals 2 thirds squared. Um, and I could put like this, all right? This would be saying y equals left parenthesis a fraction of two over three, right parenthesis squared. The dollar signs say it's supposed to be math. It will generate. You don't have to learn this. I just put this here as a reference, but it means if you're doing like a stats homework or a poster or something, you don't have to mess with like Microsoft Word's garbage equation editor. You could learn a tiny bit of syntax like this and write, this is like the equation for the mean of a variable. You can do it this way and it's nicer than having to manually edit equations, okay? Uh, if you put text with back ticks around it, it will spit out looking like a code font. If you do three back ticks, anything that you write until the next series of three back ticks will pop up like a block of code. Okay, somebody asks in chat, is this related to daring fireball markdown? Yes, markdown is a generic sort of way to uh, write text that gets converted to languages like HTML. If you see markdown anywhere, it's all the same markdown for the most part. Um, there's some slight differences in certain markdown, like some bulletin boards have their own markdown and stuff. Uh, here's a question here. Is the math syntax here the same as if I want to add equations to the plots? It can be, but to do that, you're going to need to label them using something that supports LaTeX input. Uh, ggtext for ggplot does support that. Um, yeah, so yes, the answer is yes, but kind of it can be slightly tricksy. I won't touch on it later, but I can show it in lab. Okay, moving on. So uh, basically, if you want to tinker with our markdown in some ways, here's some recommended ones, but I'm just going to kind of jump on for time. Uh, there's links all over for different ways you can mess with it. And there's actually an online textbook, Our Markdown, The Definitive Guide. Basically, every really good textbook for R is actually free and online. Um, you can usually find everything you want to in R free and online because the community is great that way. Okay. So. Uh, some caveats, our markdown is really simple, so it lacks complex features for things you might want to do. If you want fancier documents, I recommend templates. Uh, do HTML and use uh, cascading style sheets for custom formatting, which is what my slides are, are a blend of our markdown and CSS. You might also use LaTeX in uh, R&W, which are sleeve files. But as I say there in the footnote, here be dragons. LaTeX is a terrible, terrible language which exacts a permanent and terrible price on you. I recommend not learning it. Um, but LaTeX is really good for learning how to put math in documents. I say otherwise, don't learn LaTeX. Unless you're an economist where they use it as sort of like a, a badge of respectability. If you go to an econ program, you don't learn LaTeX, people don't take you seriously because that's a thing. Anyway, so. Um, I usually think default R Markdown PDFs look really nice for handouts and memos. 
send somebody a PDF generated by R Markdown. It looks impressive and nice. Just do that. Okay. So in R Markdown documents, like what you're going to turn in for a homework this week, the lines of R code you write are in things called chunks. The code is just sandwiched between three back ticks, squiggly brackets around the letter R, and then you can write as much R code as you want and then close it with three back ticks. Okay, they look like that. And in the example R Markdown document generated when you say create new R Markdown document, you can just steal those chunks there. Also, as a quick shortcut, if you want to insert a chunk into an R Markdown document, hit either Control or Command. Uh, it's like Control Alt I on a Mac. I think it's, oh God, it's Command Alt, Command, what is that? Option I, and it will insert an entire chunk. They don't have to manually type. Okay. Anyway, so if you write in your document something like this, this is an R chunk, summary, cars, it's going to produce this in your document when you knit it. It's going to show the code that you wanted it to run, but it's also going to show the output of it. Summary is a function once run on a data frame like cars. Cars is a data frame built into R. It will show you a, some summary statistics of each column in the data frame. Cars has a speed column and a distance column. These are its sort of summary information. Okay. Uh, so chunks in our markdown documents have things called chunk options. They have things that allow you to control whether or not you see the code. Echo false, for instance, up in your chunk options will prevent the code from being shown in the document. The options go here. So if you see this chunk here. It has back tick, back tick, back tick, squiggly R. Pressure here is the name of the chunk. You can name them whatever you want. I recommend not putting special characters in them like underscores or something. And then you can put comma options and you can put as many options as you want. Echo equals false here. When I knit this document, you'll see the chunk that has plot pressure in here isn't shown. Echo equals false says, do not show the chunk. So if you don't want to show your code chunks in your documents, echo false. Echo true would make them show, okay? There's a million of these code options um, for making it look the way you want. This slide is sort of a reference for them you can look at, um, and there's a million of them you can see and be overwhelmed by through this link on the R official R Markdown documentation. Common ones are, echo equals false to hide the code. Eval equals false will show the code, but not run it. So if you just want to show example code. Include equals false will hide every piece of output and showing the code itself, but still run it. This is good for running packages, uh, which I'll talk about a bit. Then there's other things that you probably won't use too often, and I'll just kind of keep going on. Okay. So um, messing with the chunk options, uh, I would recommend doing this a little bit in your uh, homework assignment for the week I'm going to talk about, which is really basic. Um, basically, do something like this, write a markdown chunk and then try doing echo equals false and knitting it and seeing that your chunk will no longer appear, but the output still will. Um, you can also change the names of your chunks like this. So if I wanted to name this chunk summarize cars, I could do that. You might be like, well, why would I want to name my chunk? A neat thing in our studio over here, if you name a chunk, like I'm going to name this one over here, first chunk, I'm going to name this one here. I can't type though. Second chunk, if I go down here, this is a browser for your R Markdown document that shows all of the headers you've written. So anything that has a pound sign in front of it will be listed as a section header. And then every chunk you name, is listed in here and you can browse to them by clicking them in this little browser and it will scroll down to it. If you have a real big document, like let's say your entire master's thesis done up as an R Markdown document, if you organize it using headers and chunk names, you can quickly browse between them. It's sort of a nice organizational tool. Don't have to do it though. Okay. So another thing you might want to do is inline R code. Sometimes what you want is not a, uh, oh, uh, here's a question. What was the shortcut for writing a new chunk? If you're on a Windows machine, 
It is Control Alt I. If you're on a Mac, it's Command maybe Option I. I haven't had a Mac in about 20 years, so everything is a mystery now. Um, so in line R code, sometimes you don't want a chunk of output in your document. You instead want like one or two values to change depending on what stuff is run in your document. Like for instance, you might want text that reads out something like the mean of this variable is this number and you don't want to manually write the number. You want it to be pulled out of the data. We do this with inline code. So we might write something like this right in your document. If you copied and pasted this into our markdown document, it would work. I might say four score and seven years ago is the same as back tick R. I keep saying back ticks. The back tick is uh, to the left of the one key above the tab and below your escape. It's this little thing over here on the same key as the tilde. R uses back ticks all the time, so learn where they are. They look like a quote, but they're not. So just know that. One of the most common problems people encounter is writing a quote when they need a back tick and things break, okay. So if I write this, four score and seven years ago is the same as back tick R space four times 20 plus seven back tick years. In the document that gets knitted, it's gonna show this. Four score and seven years ago is the same as 87 years. It does the math and only shows the result. Okay, so this is nice if you want to do calculations right in the middle of a sentence and people will never even know the map is there in the document, okay? So maybe we've done something like created a variable that has created an object in an earlier chunk in the document. Like for instance, I said, we're going to assign, I got assigned to X the square root of 77, but I want to refer to it in the text. I could say the value of X rounded to the nearest two decimals is back tick r space round x2. This says take x, the variable I created up here, round it to two decimal places, and my text will say the value of x rounded to the nearest two decimal places is 8.77. So it did this. It actually called on x from an earlier chunk, ran a function on it, pulled the output of it and stuck it straight into the text. Okay, this is actually crazy powerful. If you wanna have like a document where all the text updates depending on like what ran earlier in chunks, you can do it using inline text. A good example of this, for instance, is the New York Times did this uh, article some years ago that you basically at the top of it select a different state or county in the United States and all the text in the document changes depending on what state or county you selected. You could do that in our markdown document like that by making every number in here reference to some other object or variable in it and it can update the whole memo. This is how you can make memos that sort of update constantly depending on like data coming in. Maybe you have something that's like following somebody's Twitter feed and it could update the document regularly based on what's in it. You can do that with inline expressions and chunks and stuff. It's tremendously powerful. It also means if you're writing a journal article or something and you're actually referencing numbers like coefficients from a table, you don't have to write them in manually. You can pull them out of the table and display them. So if you rerun the analysis or something, it just updates it. You don't have to manually modify stuff. Okay, so I meant to have this slide up when I say it. This is amazing, right? Being able to dump values straight into your documents protects you from a million different silly mistakes. You don't wonder where you got some quantity in a Word document. You're not like, is that wrong? Is that a typo? Or did I actually get the right value? You just look at the formula in your markdown doc. There's also consistency. No more finding and replacing some number of things or variable throughout like an entire Word document. Change it in one place and then everywhere it's called in the document will update automatically. This is great for all sorts of like projects are constantly in motion. <clears throat> um, and also, another thing, you're way more likely to make typos in hard-coded numbers. If you write a whole bunch of numbers into a paragraph describing results or something, it's really easy to sneak in a couple errors here and there. You're probably not going to be able to make those sorts of mistakes if you're hard, if you're pulling them straight out of the actual data. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to skip this example. It's not that interesting. This is basically if you're interested in it, this is some code that would allow you to automatically update the date in your R Markdown document. So every time you press knit, it updates the date and time. It's actually how my slides uh, show their up last updated date. Um, anyway, I want to move on for time because that's sort of a boring one. 
Uh, I want to talk about data frames. Okay, so in the sample R Markdown document you're working on, we could load some built-in data to play around with. Let's load up the cars data frame. Okay, cars is a data frame, a type of object that I've mentioned earlier. Let's look at it a few different ways. So, if you type data cars and run that line, it's going to load the cars data frame into your global environment. It's going to load it in as something called a promise, and I'll show you that right here. If I say data cars, up here in the top right, it says cars is loaded, but it says promise. Promise should be interpreted by you to mean R is saying, I promise you this object named cars exists, but I am too lazy to load it until you want to use it. If, however, I start to use the object, watch me type cars into the console, but look up in that global environment as I type cars. You see how it immediately changed to my global environment without even me running it? R is a crafty beast. It thinks that I'm about to use the cars object, so it finally goes and loads it from disk, so it's prepared to use it. And now I could run that cars data frame, and you'll see it's a data frame that has two columns in it. If you go up in your global environment, you can click on this little button here. It will expand a data frame to show you the columns. The columns are speed, display, or distance. If you want a viewer that looks like Stata's viewer for data, capital V view, cars, will bring up a viewer pane up here that you can browse through your data and look at it. Okay. I don't use it very often, but it's there if you like it in that data style. Okay, so loading data with data loads it into the global environment. You can do stuff with it once it's there. Viewer, as I just showed, brings up a sort of viewer pane to look at data. Um, you could do, let's say we want to see the first five observations of cars. If I say head cars five, it's going to print the first five rows of this data frame, okay? Head just says, give me the first N elements of the object. You write the object you want first, the number of elements you want. If you don't put a number over here and you just write head cars, it gives you six by default. I don't know why it defaults to six, but that's what they chose, okay? If you wanna see the last elements of a data frame, you can use tail. Head actually works on basically any object in R to get its first elements and tail works on basically any to get its last elements. It's a good way to quickly look at something. Okay, so maybe we wanna know a little bit more about cars. There's a function in R called str for structure that shows you the structure of any object you give to it. If I say structure on cars, it's gonna tell me cars is a data frame. When you see data frame, think to yourself spreadsheet. It's basically a spreadsheet. It's a rectangular thing that has columns that are variables and rows that are observations. This data frame has 50 observations. That's 50 rows. It has two variables. That is two columns. Its two variables are speed and distance, which are numeric variables. Num means numeric. And then it shows the first so many uh, values for each of those variables. Okay, so structure kind of gives you a quick look at some object. Summary is another sort of function to get an idea of what an object looks like. If I run summary on the car's data frame, like I showed before, it shows me the speed variable, distance, it shows its minimum, its maximum, and then its quartiles, including the median, the first quartile, median, third quartile, and then it shows me the mean, okay? These are sort of generic summary statistics that are useful for numeric variables. For categorical variables, it sort of just gives you frequencies, okay? An important thing to know in R, R is an object-oriented programming language. That is complex language to say that the thing done by a function like summary will change depending on the type of object you give it. If instead of like giving a data frame like cars to summary, I gave the output to a statistical model, it's going to give me totally different output and it's going to summarize that statistical model. This is a thing you'll get used to when you play with it, but just know that if you give different types of objects to the same function, different things are probably going to pop out. Okay. So 
Might want to draw some ugly pictures of this car's data frame. The hist function, H-I-S-T, will generate the histogram of a vector. You can't do the histogram of an entire data frame, but you could pull out one variable from a data frame, and if it's numeric, get a histogram of it, okay? So for instance, I say here, I want a histogram of the speed variable in the car's data frame. So I say, look in the car's data frame, extract from it the speed variable, and then run a histogram on it. This dollar sign here is the extraction operator. It looks in the thing on the left, it takes the thing on the right, okay? If you look back at structure, You'll notice when the structure of cars was displayed, it shows a dollar sign before speed and distance. This is actually telling you, you can use the dollar sign to extract speed from cars. It's just letting you know. Okay, so this is a way to pull out the speed variable from the car's data frame and run a histogram. Okay, yeah, never heard it called it. Yeah, extraction, it's the name of the operator, but people always call it like someone else. It's the extraction operator. It's way more informative, right? Extraction like capitalism. <laughs> yes, excellent. Um, yes, it extracts things from the object. Oh, wow, that's great. That's gold. Um, oh, so here's the thing. Cars is just an example. I'm showing you the cars data frame because it's like the simplest data frame that exists in base R data, but you can play with it. Okay. Uh, oh, here's an error. When I get this error, error in plot dot new figure margins are too large. Uh, are you on a Mac? Nope. Oh, interesting. So often as an X quartz error. Um, normally what that is is the little plot window in your R Studio is too small and it's breaking in some way. So the plot window over here might be too small. I don't know. It never happens to me, but I've had other people have it and just resize the plot window and it goes away. Sometimes it goes away from closing and reopening. Um, I'd have to Google it to actually, I usually just Google the errors myself and figure it out. Um, I've seen that a bunch though, and usually it's um, better. It's, uh, you might actually have something weird in the margins. If you just ran the plot function here, it's most likely the plot window being too big or too small or open in the background. If none of those fix it, re close and reopen. Otherwise, mysterious, and I'll help you troubleshoot. Okay, I'll keep chunking. So here's some histograms. Uh, you might want to make them slightly less ugly. So you might do something like take my histogram of distance, but then say, I want the X label to be distance in feet. I want the main title to be observed stopping distance of cars. You'll see here the plot now says observed stopping distance of cars and distance in feet down here. When you write in text in R like this, you gotta quote it in either double or single quotes. These quotes are just telling that it's a string or character data. We're gonna talk about character data a lot later, okay? This is just a syntax for gussing up your histogram. Uh, so, uh, Okay, what does it say? Math with cars. Okay, so if you do an assignment with uh, like something like X, is, um, you assign to X something like Y, and you put it in parentheses like this, it will print the output of that assignment to show in your document at the same time it does it. This is just a way to save some space so you don't have to be like assigned to distance mean, the mean of this, and then print it again. This doesn't make sense, ignore it. You never have to use it, but it's just a way for me to save a line of text. What I'm showing you here is that I can extract something from cars. For instance, I'm taking cars, extract from that the distance variable. I'm taking the mean of that variable. Mean is a function that gets the average of a numeric variable. I'm then assigning that to an object called dist underscore mean. I do the same thing for the speed variable. And now I have two new objects that are just distance mean, which is the number 42.98, and speed mean, which is the number 15.4, and I'm gonna use them in a second. Here, I've dressed up a plot a little bit more. I'm saying here, I wanna make a scatter plot. I say plot, in R by default, a plot is a scatter plot, it's just what it does when you say plot. I'm gonna say, I want a scatter plot of distance on speed. Whenever you see a tilde in R, read it as like on, it's a formula. So I'm saying this thing on this thing, which means this thing is the y-axis, this thing is the x-axis. 
regression formulas work like this, like I would regress y on x, okay? I'm saying distance on speed from the cars data, so data equals cars, and then I dress it up by saying the x label should be speed, the y label stopping distance, the main title is this, PCH controls the size of the dots, and then I draw some extra lines. AB line draws, draws straight lines, H means draw a horizontal line at the mean of distance, make it fire brick red, and draw a vertical line at the mean of speed and make it cornflower blue. This is my cornflower blue one, my red brick one over here. This just shows you how you can kind of assemble graphics together. I'm breezing through this kind of quickly because I am never going to use base R graphics again in this class and we're going to learn ggplot instead, but it's good to occasionally know how to make basic plots using this type of syntax, but we're not going to use it throughout the class. It's good to know the fundamentals, but I'm not going to dwell on them. If you're curious, play with this code and see what happens and fiddle with it and you'll get a feel for it. Okay, so Getting to the Swiss data set, the last thing I want to talk about. I want to switch gears to this. This data frame Swiss is another data frame built into R, and it's the data you're going to use for your very short homework assignment that's going to be due on Tuesday. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples with it, and then you'll get unleashed on it. Okay, so the Swiss data is built into R. If you want to know what the variables in the Swiss data sweat mean, do question mark Swiss in your console and it will bring up an explanation of all the variables, what the sample is, all that kind of stuff. It's basically some like historical development indicators for Switzerland. Okay. So you can load it into your global environment by doing data Swiss and it will appear up in your top right environment. <clears throat> And then what I'm going to ask you to do in your homework is to add R markdown chunks to just maybe make some new variables, do some exploratory plots, do some if you want to, and you know how, do models, experiment with colors, shapes, that sort of stuff. Play with it, and that's what you'll end up doing in your homework. Okay, and I'm going to show you some examples. So here's a function that's kind of a useful base R function. This is a function that generates pairwise scatter plots. This is a common exploratory data analysis thing people will do when they encounter a new data set if it's not a really big data set. If you've got like 10,000 observations, this is almost inevitably a useless tool. But for small data sets like this, it lets you quickly see relationships. So I say, I want to do a pairwise scatter plot, get pairs of the Swiss data set. PCH8 makes the dots size 8 change that and see what happens. I'm making them the color violet just to show you can change the color. I give it a title. What's being shown down here is a pairwise scatter plot. What that means is, for instance, this panel right here is showing the relationship between fertility and agriculture, where agriculture is on the y-axis and fertility is on the x-axis. So you can quickly see the bivariate relationship between any two variables in this data set which is a good way to pick out obvious relationships. You see something like, for example, the relationship between examination scores in agriculture is pretty negative like this. Education and examination scores has this like nonlinear curving going on here, blah, blah. Back in the day, if you worked with a lot with small data sets, this is like one of the first things you do when you encounter a new data set and sort of eyeball relationships and the distribution of variables, okay? Nowadays, when we're often working with data sets that have tens of thousands of variables, you're just going to get like a completely purple square and it's not going to be real useful. So you might want to use other things other than this, which I'll talk about later in visualization uh, lectures. Okay, so <clears throat> something that's important to know in R and also for your homework is how to work with other packages than the stuff that comes in R. So the thing about R is that the true power of R comes not from stuff that's built into the language or built into the software. The true power comes from packages other people have written that you can download, install, and run other functions, okay? The nice thing about R is unlike Python, R has a centralized repository system of sort of um, vetted and checked packages. Everything you download with install.packages 
is basically guaranteed to work and not conflict with anything else on your system and won't have any no possibility of viruses or malware or anything like that. This is actually really nice for um, people new to programming languages. A package that I want you to use in your uh, homework and occasionally in this class is the package Pander. If you want to install Pander, what you would do is in your console write install.packages Pander and make sure to put Pander in quotes. Basically, you're putting a search term here. You're telling R that it needs to go search for something named Pander and download it. Pander isn't an object, it's a name, so you're putting it in quotes. Okay. So, unlike the library command I'm going to show you in a minute, the name of the package here has to be in quotes. When you load a package, you don't have to quote it because it's an actual object that exists in R. Just know this difference. Once you install a package in R, you do not need to re reinstall it again, like in new documents or something, unless you need to update the package or you've installed a new version of R. Once you install Pander, you don't need to install it again until you update R or you want to update Pander. Okay? Install dot packages once. Because you only ever need to run it once, you shouldn't put install.packages in any R Markdown document or R script. And in fact, if you put install.packages in R Markdown document, it will break and not knit. So don't put them in there. Okay. This is what Pander does. So if you load up Pander, you say library Pander, it will load the package. Once a package is loaded, you can use functions built into it. What I did here is I said, I'm going to run a summary of the Swiss data set, but I put that summary inside a call to pander, a function called pander. This pander call takes the output of summary that we saw earlier, which is sort of just this ugly code looking text, and it makes a pretty table that works in like HTML documents and PDF documents. I wrote this code here, pander, summary Swiss is what I want to be turned into a table. I said the style should be R markdown. You don't have to add a style, but it has different styles. Split tables equals 120, tells it to be up to 120 characters wide. And we get a nice looking table. This looks a lot better than the original summary output. It's the exact same textual output, but it looks a little bit nicer. Pander is good for doing like quick little tables in R markdown documents. It doesn't produce things that are publication ready, okay? For publication ready tables, wait till like week 10 and I'm going to go through a bunch of advanced table packages. Okay, your tables in your HTML documents won't have the alternating colored lines like this. That's a theme specific to my slides, by the way. Okay, um, you could give any, almost any R object to pander. Here's, I did head Swiss first five observations, pander table, makes a little bit nicer table here. You can give almost anything to it. In your markdown document, you're turning for your homework on Tuesday. Any output you do, put it in a pander table and make it look nice. Try it out. Okay, so your homework assignment is very simple. All I want you to do is to create a new R markdown document that has some sort of exploratory analysis of that Swiss fertility data I showed you a minute ago. You're going to upload both the .rmd document and the HTML file to Canvas. So when you save your RMD file somewhere on your computer and then you knit it, it's going to create an HTML document. That document will be in the same directory as the RMD file. Okay. So if you don't know where your uh, HTML is, go to where your RMD file is. You'll find the HTML file there. Upload both of them to get credit on Canvas. The idea is the HTML document is what you're gonna look at to see the document, but if there's any errors or things in it, I need to be able to look at the code in the RMD to troubleshoot it. All I want in this homework is for you to mix some R inline R calculations I showed earlier in the slides, tables, R output plots, with some very light text describing what you see. I don't mean doing some complicated analysis. You might just say something, if you make a scatter plot, be like, it looks like examination goes up with education, something like that. I'm not like grading you on that, okay? Um, you must use at least one R inline R calculation or reference, just at least one. Try and use some function like n row, mean, SD, core, median, min. You don't know what these functions are yet. Get help on them, use them, play with them. Don't hard code any numbers referenced in your text. And all I ask is make it 
be pleasant for you to look at, for a peer to look at. Um, have a little bit of organization, label your plots nicely, use chunk options like echo and results and limit the output in the HTML. Um, summarize things in sentences, round numbers so they're not absurdly long. Do not spend a ton of time on this. Make like one or two plots, one or two tables, something like that. That's like it. And we're going to do this in lab in a multiple different ways stuff. So if you don't even want to work on it until then, or this is confusing, we'll get to lab and we'll walk through all this kind of stuff on Monday at 3.30. There's a question I missed in chat. Can you delete code in the console if you mistype? Uh, well, I mean, you can backspace, but if you've already run it, no, if you've run it, it's just done its thing. Okay, so that's what I've got. Um, for homeworks, so there's a rubric. It's very simple. You get a zero if you don't turn things in. You get a one if it looks like it's low effort and you ignored the directions. If you basically tried to follow the directions, no matter how decent how it comes out, you're probably gonna get a two. If it's pretty good, it's okay if you have some mistakes here and there, it's gonna be a three, okay? That's basically it. Whew. Okay, so that's what we got for today. The lectures will get shorter as time goes on. I don't have to burn up all the time. Uh, do you have any questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. So the pander that we just learned, um, if we get it into a HTML, uh, will it show up? Yeah, I'll show you. So if I say, uh, so you're going to have to make sure to load the library first in your document. So the way these things, these documents work is they don't take anything from your global environment. Everything in the document has to be referenced in the document. I'm going to say library pander to load it. And then instead of doing, so if I knit this right now, you'll see that this summary that shows here is the sort of ugly basic output. If I change this from being summary cars to being pander, summary cars, and then knit. Now it's a nice pander output table. That's all pander does. It converts it from the ugly output you saw before to a slightly less ugly output that's formatted nicely. Did that answer your question or confuse more? Yeah, yeah. thank you. And did that figure margins too large thing get fixed or? Um, uh, so can we do the homework at Monday's lab? Yeah, you can. Feel free to do the homework in lab with me. Perfectly fine. How to knit. Uh, a couple of different ways to knit. The main way is there's a button up here at the top that says knit and has a little yarn symbol next to it. You press that button, it will knit the document you currently are attached to. As I, in case I had to make it clear, you are all free to leave now. That, that's everything I had for today. It's just ask, answering questions at this point. Um, so here's one. I'd like to participate in Monday's lab. I have a required class 4.30 to 5. That's fine. Show up um, for whatever period of the lab you want to. It's not required. And if you drop in like halfway through or something like that, feel free to just drop in and start asking questions. I don't care if they're questions that have been asked already. Um, just makes them faster to answer. And if you have a total overlap with lab and you still want help with stuff, I'll, I'm happy to Zoom with you, you know, to help with stuff too. Yeah, the labs will be recorded this term. I, I yeah, I'll probably just try and record them. I, I have automatic recording turned on on my Zoom, so uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I record them because we're this like Zoom era. I, I mean, I have a lot of people who take who take it for like for like out overseas. I don't expect them to be able to show up for lab on time if they're like taking the class from you know South Korea or something. Okay. Anything else? Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah, let's enjoy embarking on our wonderful journey together. Um. Hopefully it goes smoothly. Uh, oh yeah, when's the homework due? Uh, the homeworks are always due um, by end of the day Tuesday. 
Um, I'm actually, I'm pretty flexible too. If you, if you struggle on something, you miss lab or something like that, just let me know and I'll let them get turned in late usually. Um, if you turn them in late, it just means I'll end up grading it. You won't have a peer reviewer for better or for worse. Um, I tend to be mildly harsher than the average peer reviewer probably, but it doesn't matter. The points are basically made up. So, you know, it's not like you're going to fail the class. And yeah, turn in assignments on Canvas. Anything else? Technical issues, things not related to the lecture are fine too. <clears throat> what are the mysteries of life? <clears throat> okay, dokie, okay. oh, nothing else. Um, feel free to hit me up on Slack, hit me up on email if you have questions. Uh, if this was just a barrage of information and it's very confusing, come to lab, it's slow paced, we'll walk through everything. Um, I have literally in lab before have taught now two people how to right click a mouse. I do not mind minor questions and fundamental computer questions. I'm very happy to answer these things. Um, would you mind repeating the global environment comment with our markdown? Zoom crashed on me. Absolutely. Um, so no matter what you have loaded in your global environment up here, when you knit your document, it doesn't pull things from your global environment. What it does instead is it only pulls things that it can access within the chunks here. If, for instance, I wanted to use the cars data frame, well, cars is built in. So let's say you have some data that you load from a CSV into your like environment up here, right? If you load into your environment, but you try and use it in your R Markdown document, it won't work. You have to load it in the R Markdown document to knit it. Basically, you can imagine the R Markdown document is its own like our uh, instance, when you knit things, everything has to be self-contained. This is actually really nice because it forces your, re your research stuff to be reproducible because everything has to be self-contained in it. It can't work unless it is. Um, and you'll get a feel for what that means if it's not clear, especially when we get to like working through homework one. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Homework one examples don't work. The reason they don't work is I haven't posted them yet because they're kind of like uh, keys, um, but I will actually put them up because they won't give you any uh, hints about how to do things. So I will put them up. That's an excellent uh, recommendation. I should probably do that for at least the first homework and maybe the second one. Okay. Slack things breaking up. Anything else? Cool beans, okay. Um, I will catch folks on Monday. Hit me up in the meantime.